Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards, and in this lesson, we'll take a look at part two of Domain to Architecture Isomorphism. You can get a listing of all the lessons I do in Software Architecture Monday at my website at developertoarchitect.com slash lessons. In lesson 179, I defined what domain to architecture isomorphism is and also showed you a couple of examples. And so if you haven't looked at lesson 179 yet, uh, it would be best to pause this lesson and watch that one first. Uh, otherwise, this one's not going to make too much sense. But in lesson 179, the prior lesson, uh, we saw a pathway a process for selecting the most appropriate architecture, which was understanding the business drivers, translating those business drivers to architecture characteristics, and then using those characteristics, find the most appropriate architecture. And I demonstrated for you in that lesson that we still ended up with an epic failure. And the reason was because of that next step. And that is to then apply domain to architecture isomorphism and from there continue to measure and validate because business context and business needs do change as well as the need for different characteristics as well as the shape of the problem domain. So in this lesson, we're going to take a look at the shapes of different architectures, eight to be specific. Now, we're going to look at monolithic architectures as well as distributed architectures. And you're going to see various shapes, and I will describe those architecture shapes. For the monolithic, you will see that those shapes all have an outer gray box. Uh, that represents a single deployment unit. And the white boxes uh, represent the building blocks, the architectural components within that monolithic system. Now on the distributed side, you'll notice that there's only gray boxes. Each of these gray boxes represent a separate deployment unit and the interactions between those deployment units. So let's take a look at eight different architecture styles, eight of the most common architectures and the corresponding shapes associated with those architecture styles. And we'll start with the traditional and tiered layered architecture. Now the shape of the layered architecture is a single deployment unit with functionality grouped by technical categories. So you'll notice the shape here shows various layers. Could be a presentation layer, a business layer, a persistence layer, and so on. Now other things that contribute to the shape of layered are cost and simplicity. Layered architecture really does well in these two uh, types of characteristics. And you can find out more about the layered architecture in a prior lesson, number 158. Now let's move over to another monolithic architecture called the modular monolith. The shape of this architecture style is a single deployment unit with functionality grouped by domain area rather than by technical categories. And so here, contributing to this shape is also great, or I should say, low cost and really good simplicity. Uh, good for those kind of shapes of problems for maybe a startup or an initial kind of application, or ones that don't have a lot of time and, and budget to actually get out the door. And as a matter of fact, you can get more information about the modular monolith in lesson 159. Uh, the last monolithic architecture we'll take a look at is microkernel architecture. Uh, the shape of microkernel is a single deployment unit with modular independent add-on functionality, uh, things we call plugins. Uh, now, the key point about the microkernel is typically the shape of this is a single deployment, uh, but it could be that the add-on functionality, those plugins are also remote. 
Now, corresponding to the shape, we see a lot of other characteristics that add to the shape of microkernel. Uh, cost and simplicity certainly contribute to this shape. But now we've got some other things. The ability to evolve our architecture, interoperability, and by using those plugins, those add-ons as adapters to other kinds of services or other systems, or maybe even using those plugin add-on functionality for different configurations, which gives us great configurability. If you want to learn more about microkernel, you can go to lesson 160. So let's now take a look at distributed architectures. And we'll start with the microservices architecture. The shape of microservices is single purpose functions deployed as separate units of software, each owning its own data. And as a matter of fact, corresponding to that shape or adding to that shape are all sorts of other characteristics, <clears throat> high levels of maintainability, testability, and deployability. Also, high levels of scalability, elasticity, fault tolerance, and also evolvability. <clears throat> These are all the superpowers of the microservices architecture. You can go to Lesson 162 uh, in Software Architecture Monday. Uh, to learn more about um, the ins and outs of microservices, when to use it, when not to use it, and, and other things about a bounded context. Well, let's move on to something called service-based architecture. It's a very popular and very common architecture style, and the shape of this are well-defined independent domains deployed as separate units of software. So you see, with microservices, we take each function as a standalone independent unit. But with service-based, the shape here is that we take the entire domain as an independent service. As a matter of fact, additional aspects of this shape include really great levels of maintainability, testability, deployability, as well as low cost and also a fault tolerance as well. Uh, lesson 163 uh, will give you a lot more information about service-based architecture. Uh, moving on, uh, we get to the, well, older architecture style con considered a service-oriented architecture, something that's kind of, well, fallen off the trend bandwagon um, in the past decade. However, it's still a viable architecture style. And the shape of service-oriented architecture is core functionality shared across multiple enterprise systems, um, all linked through a central enterprise service bus. Now, it's interesting. Two other shapes of SOA is that of high levels of abstraction as well as interoperability, uh, being able to connect heterogeneous systems together in a single request. Now you can get more information about SOA in Lesson 164 on my website. Two more architecture styles in the distributed form, and that is event-driven architecture as the first one here. Now, this architecture style has a shape uh, that asynchronously reacts to events that are triggered within the system. And as a matter of fact, contributing to this shape are high levels of abstraction, performance, elasticity, scalability, fault tolerance, and the ability to evolve our architecture for frequent change. You can get more information about event-driven by going to lesson 165. And finally, our last architecture we'll look at is space-based architecture. Now, with space-based architecture, the shape of this, the overall shape, is all transactional data is cached in memory. And what this gives us is perhaps the highest levels of performance, scalability, and elasticity, because space-based architecture, the shape of this, removes the database from the transactional equation. As a matter of fact, I describe space-based architecture and how it works, and, and as a matter of fact, where it gets its name uh, in Lesson 166. 
So there you have it, everyone. There's the shape of each of these eight common architecture styles. Now, you can take the shape of your problem, which of course you will have to come up with, <laughs> and see if it matches the shape of an architecture that you're considering. Not only from the characteristics standpoint, but the overall shape of that particular architecture. So this has been Lesson 180, Part 2 of Domain to Architecture Isomorphism. Uh, stay tuned in two more Mondays for the next lesson in Software Architecture Monday.